Hi, everybody. Welcome to the program. It's Realities, the podcast that listens to people, learns about life and the things that you do with your life, the passions that you follow. I'm Mark Fonseca Rendeiro, also known as Bicycle Mark. And today, it's not a kitchen table podcast, as we will continue doing uh, this season. But those of you who have been with me for a few months, if not years, you'll have heard our guest today before, and he's returning today. I'm talking about Matthew Dons, and I, I pushed this show to the top of the queue because, well, Matthew is in a battle for his life, and um, talking about it, I think, is helpful, and also reaching out with people and, and even in the form of uh, financial help. So I want to mention Matthew Dons. That's two T's in Matthew, D-O-N-S dot org. I'll just put a link, realitiespodcast.com. You'll be able to follow it. Uh, help Matthew to fight uh, cancer, to stay around longer, right? To have more time with his family. I'm really glad to have him back on the program. It's going to be a two-parter because I don't, want to keep you long. I know how podcasts are these days. So we're going to do half today and half in just a few days. Uh, that's the beauty of podcasting. We're not tied to any format. We can we can talk and we can stop and we can continue again. And Matthew is someone that always has reminded me of what is possible in podcasting. And, and, and today we're talking about education, learning, and a very interesting experiment that he's involved in in his home I say experiment. I mean, everything in life is an experiment, but Matthews is just fun, informative, and extremely interesting. Whether you have children or not, this is about our society and how we are prepared for it as children and even as we grow up. So without further ado, let's get to it. So hi, everybody. We're here on the program. Uh, it's been a little while since the last time we spoke with uh, Matthew Dons, who joins us today from Tokyo. So let's first of all say, hi, Matthew. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Um, okay. And um, let's see, we spoke maybe at the beginning of this year, maybe even towards the end of last year. Yeah, I think um, the end of, end of last year. Yeah. yeah. And, and so for those uh, listening, you know, we've been uh, discussing your battle um, with with cancer and uh, the the fight to to live longer, right? I mean, that's that's the way to put it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, live longer and try and um, keep a reasonable quality of life. I guess is um, you know, and those two things are, are often in con conflict. It seems <laughs> because yeah, you know, maybe the most effective. Um, Treatments are quite damaging to the body. Yeah, um, so I, and tough. and and I think many people uh, around the world, when you talk, for example, about chemotherapy, have thoughts, right, and have experiences. More specifically, actually, um, maybe not directly, but maybe someone close to them. And I know that you. It's not the topic of today's program, but I know that you could uh, write volumes on this subject. Yeah, and I mean, I think <clears throat> the main thing we associate it with is is hair loss. Um, although, <laughs> from from what I know, <clears throat> the little I know about cancer treatment, it seems that hair loss is far more um, associated with radiation therapy, um, mm. and only, only a, a few chemotherapies do cause hair loss. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, because chemotherapy targets cells that are rapidly dividing, so mm. um, <clears throat> if you think, like for an adult, the only bits of your body that are kind of always... Um, Re regrowing a kind of hair follicles, skin, lining of intestine, lining of stomach, um, bone marrow, unfortunately, where, where your blood is made. Um, so that's why kind of, yeah, you sometimes do get hair loss with, with chemotherapy. But obviously, um, that's <clears throat> kind of the most visual, <clears throat> visually striking thing you see is, is sort of, you know, the, the photos or videos of, of the, the people who have lost their hair um, as part yeah. of cancer treatment. But from what, yeah, from the little I know, it does seem that's more associated with um, radiation treatment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, some some chemotherapy, I think particularly the chemotherapies for breast cancer, 
Um, yeah. And obviously, well, for, for, for I guess lots of cultures, it's more of a big deal for women to lose their hair anyway than men. Mm-hmm. It's kind of more, more of an issue. So I think it's it's what, <clears throat> why we often associate with, associate that with um, <clears throat> chemo. But um, yeah, so it's always always a struggle, kind of making a balance between quality of life and treatment especially you know like in my case where it's 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 terminal cancer so it's you know the treatment is not a cure it's kind of it's treatment to sort of try and delay delay the end as it were um sure so that makes kind of the balance even more tricky throughout this process what you've been doing and that's also part of i think making a podcast several podcasts including this one is that you've been um documenting uh, not only what's happening with you, but also things that you think are important that perhaps like many people in this world who, who say, oh, when I have time, you know, later on, I'll, uh, I'll finally record or write. Uh, and I don't know how you're doing in terms of writing, but I know in terms of recording and anyone who goes to your YouTube channel, uh, I believe under your own name, Matthew Dons, uh, will get to see you've made, you've built up uh, a library of talks on subjects, uh, subjects you have experience with or subjects that you have an interest in. And in some cases, it's it's both of those, really. And among those topics, I know very close to your heart is um, education and more specifically um, homeschooling, which is something that maybe not everyone around the world is familiar with, although the name gives part of it away, homeschooling. So I th- thought it would be and and we'd been discussing you know what we'd like to record uh uh now and one idea was yeah let's talk about that education that that homeschooling so i know there's tons of topics we could cover but today we're going in this direction um i mean first of all prior to so you have two children that's a a good detail i think to have um and that'll certainly impact how someone looks at education uh um, but even prior to having children, I mean, what was your thinking on the subject of you, you weren't homeschooled, right? What were you thinking when it comes to education? So, um, I went to regular state schools in the UK. Um, in the UK education is, um, uh, so <clears throat> we sometimes have this term in the UK postcode lottery, or I guess in the US <laughs> it, you know, zip code lottery. Um, we, we often use it for, um, healthcare actually for kind of comparing, um, different levels of healthcare in different areas of the country because there's quite a lot of, um, autonomy. So, um, and the same is true of education. So in England, um, education policy is obviously made by the national government, but local government have some power and mm. something a bit kind of overlapping with local government is called the local education authority. Um, and they have quite a bit of power as well. So um, the um, the logistics of the education vary quite a lot, in, depending on where you are in the country, um, mm-hmm. even to, um, to the degree of which um, ages you go to various different schools. So... Um, <laughs> Hmm. My local education authority had, um, when I was a child, the schooling system had three schools that you went to. So you went to a first school, a middle school, and a secondary school. Most of the country um, had a two-school system. So you went to primary school um, and then secondary school. Um, Other bits of the country have grammar schools, which you needed um, an entrance exam for at the age of 11, an exam called the 11+. plus. Um, so I went through the regular state school system. Um, I, yeah, hated it, I guess. Um, yeah. (laughs) Oh uh, yeah, obviously. (laughs) Um, both my parents are teachers. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, Mm. and I, yeah, I, I didn't, it didn't occur to me that you didn't have to go to school. Um, Obviously, some countries have laws regarding homeschooling. Um, Germany is the example most of us are familiar with where homeschooling is not allowed. Um, yeah. I think that's um, a, a partly a historical thing with the history right. of Germany. Um, yeah. And c- 
currently the, the kind of justification for that is um, that, yeah, children could be religiously indoctrinated or whatever by their mm. crazy parents, um, <laughs> you know, with potentially disastrous results as we saw in 1939 or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I just, homeschooling wasn't something I had, I think, I don't, don't even think I'd even heard of it growing up. I, I knew I hated school. I knew I didn't want to go to school. Um, By the way, was that was that because of, you know, many people I think hated, especially high school, because of the way socially things work and how you're treated? Or was this much more than that? Oh, yeah, much more than that. Although, yeah, the social thing, especially now as I'm looking back, um, yeah, there's a lot about the, the, what would you call it, the social microcosm in in a school yeah. <laughs> being treated like crap because you're smart or or yeah, however yeah. you look and that kind of thing yeah, yeah yeah and i'd say that the main thing was kind of school turned me away from education i guess it kind of turned me like mm. you know as a child especially as a young child i was always more interested in learning stuff than playing i guess um mm -hmm. you know very avid reader um i yeah, the, the thing I was really into actually, kind of as as um, I don't know, I guess like as maybe eight year old, nine year old, or whatever. I was really into like space, and I yeah. guess at kind of ten, eleven years old, really into cosmology. Um, it it was really amazing that to me that um, there were these books that were <clears throat> science books, but written for you know, regular audience, right? The, the whole kind of what we now call popular science books. And mm. the book in the UK that I think really um, <clears throat> kind of made that movement was A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And, um, you know, which was, which is kind of a, the first really popular book on cosmology, kind of relativity, quantum theory, that kind of thing. Um, and, because it was written for a lay audience, uh, there was only one equation in the whole book. In fact, it was kind of a joke in the um, in the introduction. Stephen Hawking said, "My publisher told me that every equation we included would cut the sales by fifty percent, um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we decided to put one equation in, which is obviously um, e equals mc squared, which is part of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity." And it was just amazing to me that as a child, I could read a book like that and you know, understand is too strong a word, but I, I could, I could get through the book. Um, yeah. and this was, you know, topics that were, po you know, postgraduate, <laughs> you know, post PhD, yeah. postdoctorate research level. And yet as a child, yeah. we could read these, um, in in incredible popular science books. Mm -hmm. And it was such a contrast to what we studied at school. Um, and, and yeah, just e even as a child, I just, I could see that the way school worked seemed to be a little bit odd. It was kind of, you know, even <laughs> as a child, the, it struck me this is a very strange way to learn things. It's a strange idea and kind of who, who is it who's decided what we should learn? Like, yeah. I, I, you know, where did it come from? And obviously now, now as an adult, I've looked into a lot of that and, um, but at the time, at the time, I just, yeah, the whole thing just struck me as very silly. And um, I did, yeah, generally okay at school, although, you know, in England, at least at the time, there was a lot less um, measuring of kids, fortunately. It's now getting clo huh. closer to the US, but at least at that time, it's a lot, lot less measuring of kids. So no concept of, um, in the US, there's a system called, um, is it GPA, grade point average? Okay. Where basically in the US at school, I think people are kind of scored for each subject and they have this running yeah. total, average total. Um, in the UK, there's no high school graduation. So there's no concept mm -hmm. of graduating from high school. We don't have a high school diploma system. Um, okay. So there is kind of less measuring than there is now. Um, huh. But still, No countrywide exam or something? So there, there are there are countrywide examinations um, that are kind of um, we call them public examinations, which is is interesting and potentially quite relevant to homeschooling because um, they are open to the public. 
so you can pay the exam fee and take the exam without attending school, for example. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So, so you, you know, we have these public examinations, but they're not compulsory. So, mm-hmm. um, when I was at school, you took the um, the exams with a general certificate of secondary education. Took them at the age of sixteen. Um, what's called compulsory schooling in England lasts until fifteen and a half. At least it did at that time. So you could easily mm. leave school without physically taking the exams. Um, so I did kind of okay at school. Did um, at least kind of early on, I did very well in in mathematics and, and science subjects. Um, mm-hmm. Although, yeah, it got to the point that I just I just hated being at school so much. And I remember there was a yeah there was such a, a certain point, I guess probably fifteen, sixteen, something like that, where it was like school turned me off wanting to learn stuff, I guess. Um, yeah. Fortunately, I had already discovered what we now call the underground. So, <laughs> um, yeah, fortunately, I was still, you know, even the, the oppressive power of school wasn't enough to turn me off hacking and, you know, interest in phone freaking and terrorist yeah. techniques and homemade explosives did, and making smoke bombs and all that kind of stuff that that did you yeah. have did you ever have the the classic experience i mean classic i hope some people have had this of a a teacher in particular that you actually did uh like and 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 sort of led you to places you had never uh been interested in or that kind of thing uh, um i don't uh, I mean, there, there are certainly, yeah, I, I had some really great teachers and, you know, they were, they were great despite of the system that they were in and they were critical, mm-hmm, critical mm-hmm. of the system that they were in and, um, yeah. you know, uh, but, um, they, they always said the same thing to me and particularly to my parents, which is that, you know, oh, we can, you know, we can tell you're bored and, you know, this is, no, <laughs> this is no good for you, but mm. it's going to be better at the next stage, whatever the next stage is. So, so that was kind of the, that was the kind of the lie fed to me throughout the education system was that, you know, right. that, that they'd write things like, you know, school reports that like, Matthew is bored by GC, <laughs> GCSE science, but will, will excel at the, you know, A level. When I, when I went to do the, so the A levels are what we do in England when um 17 and 18. Um, mm. So it's just, um, Equivalent, I yeah, equivalent, I guess, of high school. I, I yeah. don't know much about the US education system, but <laughs> um, but in Japan, it would be the equivalent of of kind of high school. Um, yeah. And of course, then you know it was it was boring and ridiculous, and the teacher said, "Oh, but you know, when you get to university, that'll be you know that'll be really great." Right. And then, of course, right. first, first year of university, everyone says, "Well, you know, you have to learn all this stuff first, <laughs> and then the next year it's going to be better," or you know do your master's yeah. degree or whatever. Um, so that was kind of the, the lie that was fed to me completely throughout um, education. And I, yeah, you know, after being told that kind of every few months for several years, you get to the point where you say, hang on, you know, I've, I've heard this again and again and again. <laughs> when when do we get to the yeah. good bit? Um, yeah. And for some reason, it seems in... in um, in the school system, the the most interesting aspects of any subject kind of get minimized as you go along. <laughs> so, huh. you know, if you think of mathematics, for example, um, all the kind of fun aspects of mathematics somehow get kind of destroyed or drowned out in schooling. And, and the focus of school mathematics is really arithmetic, um, which is, you know, a, a very, very small, first of all, it's a very, very small part of mathematics. <laughs> it's a kind of a, a small mechanical part that is, you know, mm-hmm. is, is is now done by by machine on our behalf, um, mm-hmm. and yet that's what's really emphasised in school. You know, techniques for long multiplication, long division, um, kind of crude statistical methods, um, num- you know, number crunching we call it, and that's a, that's a very kind of small um, and quite frankly unimportant part of mathematics, <laughs> at, at least at least the way it's done in school. Um, yeah, so, so I just, that, I guess it was that underlying lie, I guess it was when I, 
And I kind of really saw through that when I saw that whatever happened, no matter how um, far along the journey I went, I'd always be told, you know, yes, this this bit you're stuck in now is unpleasant, but the next bit's going to be really good. <laughs> and, you know, you can only be told that a certain number of times when you think, come on, this is, right. Right. This is right. getting ridiculous. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so when I... Um, when I had my, you know, we, we had kids. Um, yeah, I just, I well, knew I didn't yeah. want my son to kind of go through that. Um, and and you, having children, and of course, the context, uh, part of the context anyway. You're you're now find yourself in Japan when the children are are uh, about to be born. I think both born in Japan, or yeah, yeah, both born in Japan. Yeah, so you know you're going to be there, right? And um, and then, uh, of course, your wife, Shikako, and, and what were these conversations like? I can imagine, okay, you had your bad uh, uh, experience, but I wonder what, what she brought to the table and what those conversations were like when it came to, okay, what will we do in terms of education for the children? Yeah, I think she... Um, so, so, so I was quite... Um, adamant i guess that um <laughs> that we'd we would homeschool um she was so so my wife was um she, she went through the japanese um education system she she's not kind of an, an academically minded person i guess you'd say um mm -hmm. so she sort of uh after graduating high school she went to instead of university she went to sort of a vocational college i think um yeah. but yeah, in discussion with her, yeah, it seemed she was quite sceptical about the education she had had. Um, huh. um, one thing that really struck with me is, is she said um, there was a certain a certain moment at school when she found out that her English teacher, who was Japanese, had never visited an English-speaking country. So this is a person oh, yeah. teaching her English had never. Sure. <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, and I'm sure all over the world that happens a lot. Yeah. 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 And that was kind of a moment <laughs> where she, she, she then sort of thought, well, okay, I wonder about the other teachers then, you know, as, um, mm. as, as mm. my, as my chemistry teacher ever worked as an industrial <laughs> chemist, for example, or, or whatever. Um, yeah. And I guess part of, yeah, I guess maybe, one of, one of the reasons that she, she sort of a, a, agreed to, to homeschooling, I guess, was that um, we're, we're quite concerned about wanting our kids to be um, really, really bilingual, really kind of truly bilingual. Um, right. And I think she, she was sort of concerned that if, if my son Edward went to a Japanese school, he would lose his Japanese language, uh, he would use it, lose his English language ability. Mm -hmm. Um, because we'd seen that happen with a lot of other people. Um, hmm. In Japan, there are some schools that where English is the main language. Um, so these are called international schools. Um, right. But they weren't really an option for us anyway because um, A, they're very right. expensive and B, they happen right. to be quite far away. Um, okay. Yeah, so we sort of... <laughs> It wasn't. It wasn't like a, a kind of a really big struggle to decide what to do. Um, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I kind of, I, you know, I wasn't sure about the law in Japan, so I sort of, I, right. I, I looked okay. into the legal situation. I found the legal situation is quite unclear, um, which could be useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but but one thing I did find is that no one had ever been prosecuted for homeschooling their <laughs> kids. Um, Good sign. So in Japan there are sort of four relevant educational laws or something. So there's the, the bit of the Japanese um, constitution, which says essentially the government has to, uh, the government's role in education is to help the parents educate the children. Um, there's a Japanese law that says that Ooh. local government must provide a place at school for children um, mm. there's an education act that says children must receive a normal education, but it's not, um, nowhere in Japanese law does it define what normal is. And the, the, okay. the, so the history of that is that, um, what it meant really was not a military school because, um, before world war two, 
um, there were lots of schools run by the military and that was being you know, a part of what got the the people militarized i guess and got got yeah. into world war Two. that's yeah. my, my daughter jessica you can hear coughing in the background she's yeah. just she's just woke up from her nap oh. and then oh. the fourth relevant law is um the uh universal declaration of human rights that japan has you know is a signatory of and again that um I forget the exact wording, but it's you know something along the lines of governments have to help um, parents to educate their children, and um, it's basically the parents have to retain some kind of freedom or autonomy, something like that. So there are these mm-hmm. sort of four relevant bits of law um, that potentially could could be contradictory because a lot of people think that the Education Act that says um, local government must provide a place a school for every child. Lots of non-legal people would think, well, that means everyone has to go to school. But actually, that's a law not about what parents have to do or even what children have to do. It's, a, it's saying that the local government has to pay for schools, essentially. You know, that mm-hmm. it's, it's a law that basically says Japan provides free state education. So I kind of got familiar with the law. Um, I did a bit of Googling to find out what, kind of, what other people did in Japan um so the, yeah. one kind of big group of people in japan who homeschool are um the u.s military because you know there's huge numbers of u.s military here we've got lots of lots of military bases and um yeah lots of them will you know be here for um i guess three years would be a, a, a regular tour and mm-hmm. um the you know the the parents decide to homeschool the kids because maybe my understanding is that when you're US military here, you basically stay on the base 24 hours a day. It's like a miniature city. Um, yeah. And the bases maybe have preschool, but don't, don't have, have schools. So, you know, maybe if you're, if you're a rich military family, you send your, your kids to the international school. Um, mm-hmm. If you're a regular military family, you, you homeschool. So I kind of looked at what yeah. they did. Um, and yeah, I, I, I saw that in Japan, often homeschooling families will um, register their kids with the local state school. So um, when my son Edward became school age, which in Japan is uh, six years old, um, it, she, she went along to the local school and said, we'd like to register my son for school, but he's not going to come here. And yeah. um, the head teacher said, you know, of course you can't do that. It's illegal. Uh, uh-huh. We said, no, it's not. And, um, and then, and then, you know, we, uh, we got, um, oh, that's it. The, the, the head teacher said, um, you should talk to the local government educational officials. So my wife called them up and said, um, we're registering our son at the local school, but he's not going to go. We're going to homeschool. And they said, uh, you can't do that. Homeschooling, um, is not possible in Japan. And we yeah. said, we said, yes, it is. And then they then they said, um, we we will come and meet you to hear your concerns, but we're just going to meet you and, and talk to you, and that's it. Um, and I I knew this was going to be kind of an important meeting, um, so I decided it'd be best if my wife wasn't there because um, you know I felt that the education people would be able to bully her and wouldn't be able to bully me, um, oh. and. I, and um, and also, because my Japanese isn't great, you know, obviously the conversation would be going on in Japanese um, and they'd easily talk in a way that I wouldn't really know what was going on. So I, I found um, a volunteer translator. Found like, um, my local um, local district, there's like a, some kind of NPO that provides volunteer translators for kind of medical wow. stuff, legal stuff, that kind of thing. So um, I went along and and sort of met, met this person and said, you know, would you come to this very important meeting and be a be an interpreter for me? Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so I had had this meeting with the with, with the guys. Um, so these two people came from my local educational board. Um, they, I think, they had said they were going to come and and listen to listen to our concerns for twenty minutes. They ended up staying an hour. And basically, about halfway through the meeting, um, it was. I think they kind of understood halfway through the meeting that I was going to homeschool my kids, <laughs> um, and 
you know, I, I basically said to them, um, to, you know, talking to you, it doesn't seem you really understand the legal situation. I think you should go and get legal advice and come back to me. Um, yeah. And they agreed, basically. They said, mm, we're kind <laughs> we of, you know, because yeah. because I had, a, you know, I was sat there with, I printed out some of the, the legal stuff from, from the web, you know, from the Japanese mm-hmm. Ministry mm-hmm. of Education website and stuff. So, you know, I, I knew the law pretty well. Um, yeah. And, um and they also said that they would get advice from um, the neighboring local government because although I live in Tokyo, I'm right on the edge of Yokohama, and I knew that there were lots more homeschooled families in Yokohama because there's lots of military bases there. And ah. um, they knew that as well. Um, and I so sort of said, you know, you should, you know, go and go and talk to the to the Yokohama government, and see what what they um, do. And then um, then. Towards the end of the meeting, they said they said basically something like, "If you write us a letter saying your child is not going to be attending school, we will issue like an exemption." And they said, mm-hmm. um, "Issuing this exemption in no way um, is a statement of policy about homeschooling. We don't recognise homeschool." But essentially, they agreed that he didn't have to go to school. Right. Um, right. So it was quite it was quite an interesting experience. It was a yeah a very interesting hour. Um, talking yeah. to these uh, these two guys from the education board, and it's it quite funny that um, one of their arguments for like why you should go to school is that we go we go to all the trouble of providing this place at school, so you should go. Which is kind of a, a very bizarre for, for me as a Westerner seems a very bizarre argument, but I think is actually quite a typical um, Japanese argument. <laughs> you know, in, mm. in, in Japan, it's sort of if someone's gone to the trouble of doing something, then out of respect, you should go along with their plan, which for me seems quite a, a, a strange thing if it's something as serious as the education of your child. Um, but anyway, so that yeah. was that was the meeting, and we, you know, we got this um, exemption from them, um, and uh, yeah, and then it begins, and, it. <laughs> and and then it begins, and um, and that was, you know, and and is, is obviously still ongoing, and um, is still changing all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so, I mean, look, there's there's pl- probably lots of people who um, would be interested in homeschooling, but the classic, besides the law, uh, the classic uh, uh, reason for not doing it could be, oh, my career, my I don't have time. I, of course, it would be lovely. So, I think we should definitely get into that for the two of you. Yeah, and and I think that's um, it's it's a. Uh... It's a, it's a fascinating and powerful thing to look at because you can't really look at that without thinking what's school for. And I think well, that right. what, what it really <laughs> yeah. reveals is that the the key purpose of school in most countries is, is childcare, really. That, yes. Um, and and it's, it's childcare for the convenience of the parents, I guess. But also, um, in a lot of countries, I think there's this idea that children are somehow dangerous if left to their own devices that sort of, you know, will get these feral kids wandering the streets or, you know, be like, um, what's that book? Lord of Lord of the Flies. The Flies, yeah, yeah. You know, or that, yeah, we'll, we'll sort of, you know, our kids will be kind of wandering the streets, setting fire to cars and taking heroin well, yeah, or whatever. It, it's just this more bizarre so than idea. Ever constant uh, surve- uh surveillance <laughs> constant w- being watched uh, uh is uh, is something that's i mean it was always around as an idea you know watch over the kids someone should be there but certainly we do live in an era i don't have children but still i, I observe and people more so than ever and even regardless of culture i would say in my travels uh someone always has to be with the children and uh and watch not just be in the same building but same room and then yeah yeah i think that you know there's there's a, a lot of that is kind of i guess media related um that yeah fear know, is the yeah f- f- fear factor um yes yeah, sort of fear of safety issues and of course fear of kind of what they call in the u.s stranger danger um <laughs> you know all, all, the, all this kind of thing um so so yeah, you know, when you look at the practicalities of home of homeschooling, it's yeah, it, it, you suddenly um, it's like looking at that reveals part of the real reason we have school, which is really childcare. I think in most countries, education is like a secondary goal um, of mm. you know 
of, of school, although at least in England it used to be the other way around that that you know school in England was designed to do um, one of two things really. Um, for the elite, it was designed for them um, for their children to be prepared to go out and run the British Empire, right? You know, the right. elite would get um, you know either a military route or a civil service route. But end up, yeah. you know, running a little bit of the British Empire, empire in India or Africa or whatever, um, yeah. and then the other path for the for, for for the for the great unwashed was to sort of get a job in a factory, um, right. you know, or possibly an office, um, <laughs> yeah. and and particularly in Japan, there's sort of this idea that um, you know now Japanese schools exist to take care of the of children. Although in Japan, interestingly, I think the majority of women do not work, um, uh, at least until until very recently, um, it was kind of assumed that um, in a in a Japanese family, the co- Japanese companies would pay well enough for the um, the husband to support the whole family, which you know was true in the U.S. Um, probably until the early seventies, I guess. And yeah. in Japan, it's sort of al- almost still true now. Um, in yeah. my case, um, you know, we we work from home anyway, teaching English. So the practicality thing, again, wasn't really an issue um, in my case. But if it had been, I like to think I would have just rearranged whatever was going on <laughs> to make sure mm. that, you know, I could... I could um, yeah, be be at home to to educate the kids. Where you know, I think um, almost any job now you can do from home, really, um, or, or at least right. at least a far far wider range of jobs you can do from home than people think. Um, yeah. And I think many adults don't really like their job anyway, so you know, maybe <laughs> maybe um, they can they yeah. can sort of re-engineer, re engineer, redesign their whatever they you know they're doing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's that traditional concept of the nine to five office job that you have to be at. That still exists, of course, in different places, as you just pointed out. Uh, m- maybe a little more strongly or surviving longer in Japan, that has protected this tradition of uh, your career is your life, and in between your your home. Um, but um, and that it'll provide in exchange for your your presence and your energy. Uh, you'll have a a good life for whoever is at home, not just yourself. Uh, but yeah, indeed, as you point out, you know this has changed in much of the world, so it's not as much of a impossibility that you could be home anyway. Uh, although, as I think about it, I know a lot of people who work from home and then will send their children to some kind of a daycare for a few hours a day so that they can, they, they would say, so that they can get some work done and that <laughs> type of thing. And I get the feeling you guys, that's that's the exact opposite of what you would ever do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, you know, in, in life you need to kind of decide on the outcomes you want first and then engineer everything around that. I I, I don't think you can really do it the other way around. Um, mm. You know, if you if you look at the the reality of what you think you can if you think of the, the, the sort of the reality of how you think you can survive and then try and fit your your desirable life into the tiny little bit of space that leaves um you're, you're going to be pretty miserable um huh. you yeah. know i think you know just like the cliche of someone who who hates their job and lives for the weekend um you know that's yeah. not that's that's just completely out of balance because like why, <laughs> why would you why do you be spending sort of 40 to 60 hours a week, um, you know, on something you hate and then just have those two days of enjoyment at the weekend? Um, yeah. It seems a little bit odd but, to me. Yeah, but that was society, right? And I mean, I don't know. It seems like we have more choice now. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, Perhaps. we do. But, you know, one of the problems with, um, I guess you could you might call it industrial scale schooling mm-hmm. is that schooling school prepares children for the past of the country right. and children have to live in the future, right? They're not even going to live in, the, in, the, in our present. Yeah. So, you know, a good example of this, actually, I remember when I was um, at school, one of our teachers said that on the day he left school, so he finished school at, 
the age of 16. On the day he walked home from school, 30, 40 minute walk, he had five job offers walking home. Well, I mean, because of his age, he would have been describing 1950s England. In 1950s England, there was a labor shortage. Right, this is the time of the Jamaican dysphoria. So this is the time when um, we're, we're sort of trying to um, increase uh, immigration from the West Indies um, because there's a labor shortage in England. Um, mm-hmm. So that was the reality that he left school in, was that you could walk along the street and most you know, shops and factories would have help wanted signs. Um, yeah. I was at you know I was at school in I guess nineteen nineties and already we knew that for most most of us at school we wouldn't have a career for life you know we uh-huh. already knew right. that that was um, kind of on its way out except except mm-hmm. for like a maybe a small percentage of, of people who were going into a, um uh, I guess a, a quite a, a well defined profession like dentistry or mm-hmm. architecture or whatever but most of us would you know be expected to do you know ha- have a series of jobs throughout life um the yeah. job job for life kind of idea had gone um mm-hmm. and yeah one of the one of the problems of i think the central problems of industrialized schooling is is just this idea that you know we, we should really be preparing the kids for the the future they're going to be in and you know a, a trivial example of that is, is you know my son is edward is eight years old um mm-hmm. he I do not think he will ever drive a car, except no. except maybe for pleasure, right? Because if you just think how, um, you know, you had a, oh, I forget the, your your friend's name, but you had a, you did a, a, a podcast episode recently on education. Um, oh, Gabe, Gabe and Gabe, and you know, Gabe pointed out that um, in the US, I think like one of the most common jobs is truck driver, and. Yeah. Um, and yet, interestingly, it's actually um, the um, driving for for industry is the one that's going to be most quickly replaced with with self driving vehicles. Um, mm-hmm. And there are like technical reasons why it's actually much easier to have a truck that drives itself than you know um, a, a tourist car, for example, that drives itself. Right? Um, yeah. So. Sure. You know, just I mean, just think about how like those people are going to be, um, how, you know, out they're they're, they're going to be sort of um, training people now, training for their truck driving license, um, who are only going to that job is only going to be around for a couple more years, um, you know. So so my my son probably will never never drive a car, just like um, you know, I've never I've never crank started a car. Right, you know, with like one of those handles, right? Because, right. Um, you know, the the I think the last cars built with those handles were like what nineteen sixties, probably. Um, uh, if if that, you yeah, know, if, yeah. if if that. Um, so you know, there are lots of things that when we you know we think about the you know you and I probably ne- never used a slide rule. Slide rules no. were, you know, looked like they were going to be around forever. Like no, you know, no one. No one in the 1970s was thinking, what's going to replace the slide rule? Well, no, no one, you know, or very few people predicted the, the pocket electronic calculator. Um, yeah. So so then, you know, we start thinking about what what is, you know, how, how do we prepare children for their future, not for our past? And, yeah. um, you know, and, yeah, so go ahead. And, and not necessarily, I mean, I wonder about this. I, I think I know, actually. <laughs> You're not necessarily, so... Many schools are always concerned with the idea, especially as you get older, preparing you for a job, right? Uh, that you learn, that you enjoy secondary. Thir- that's not as important as when you get out there, you're going to do some kind of job. Um, especially, okay, if you go to vocational school, even more so, allegedly. But when you teach at home, um, I mean, h- how, how much of it is I am preparing my children for a career because what I like to think in my little romantic uh, uh, v- version of your of your homeschooling is that actually you have this joy for reading, learning, and I don't. I, I like to think that you're not actually uh, uh, sitting there worrying about career, at least at this point. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. That you know, I'm I'm preparing my children not to have a 
<laughs> not but, to have a career. You know, I've, I've told I've told my son many many times. You know, never never get a job. You know, never <laughs> never be in that position um, where you're dependent on someone else for for you know your financial livelihood. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, whatever you do, don't go because it's it's a very very weak situation to be in. Um, yeah. Again, just uh, last week, there was a report published in Scotland saying that um, in Scotland, they expect over the next 10 years, um, I think something like 1.4 million jobs to be replaced by machines or computers, however you want to put it. Um, right. And w- one of the interesting things w- was that part of what they concluded from this was that um, not that um, there'd be much higher unemployment, but just that lots of people would have several crappy jobs, uh-huh. you know, which I think is 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 now getting to the point of almost being obvious. Um, yeah. and, and you know, it was that sort of hum- humans will be doing, uh, you know, f- um, more and more like a, like a, a wider variety of narrower tasks um, that can't, at least at the moment, be automated. And as time goes on, more and more of those will get automated and humans will be left with a kind of, you know, whatever scraps are left over. Um, And if you think about that in terms of equality, you know, it's just natural that it's going to hit the the least least well-off, least least educated, you could say, um, mm. you know, it's it's going to certainly hit a certain sector of society more um, more than the others. So, you know, kind of pre- preparing for that, um, thinking about, I, I, I worked as an IT instructor for a while and um, we'd often get people coming to the IT school who were middle-aged and had been made redundant and had done one job for life um, in an industry that had just died. So, you know, uh, I remember some guy coming from the, the print setting industry. So he had mm. he had been one of these people who, you know, got trays of metal letters and movable type and did type yeah. did typesetting. Um and the industry was just destroyed by desktop publishing. You know, it can do it could do a better job. You know, that's that's a scary thing is that a lot of this this uh, mechanization does a better job than humans um yeah. and yeah the human bit is kind of um often often we uh, yeah, often we have like this romantic view that the human bit will be the creative bit but that's, that's the hope right yeah that's <laughs> the hope you know that there'll be or or there'll be some incredible skilled bit um that you know it's just really hard for humans to do but already, um, you know, robots can do surgery better than humans in in some narrow cases at the moment. Um, that's going to change in the future. Um, the robots can definitely drill teeth better than a dentist can drill <laughs> teeth. Um, and yeah, it's just going to get to the point where I think the 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 bit that can't be mechanized is not necessarily the desirable bit. It's not going to be that you know you have this um, wonderful uh, thing where you know, the humans get to do the the lovely aspects of the work, and the the robots do the kind of the drudgery, which which was the promise of robotics, right? Was kind of... You've been listening to Realities Podcast. This is part one, a conversation with Matthew Dons on education at home and learning for the future. And come back for part two. If you're subscribed, realitiespodcast.com, you'll receive the show the minute it comes out in the next few days. And you can also leave a comment there or uh, wherever you use social media. You will find Realities Podcast. I'm Bicycle Mark, Mark Fonseca Rendeiro. I'll speak to you again very soon. Thanks for listening.